Okay, this morning, you know, last week, obviously, uh, recognized around the world, a lot of people, you know, uh, I guess in the, I don't know if I want to say the western part, you know, we recognized last Sunday was like Resurrection Sunday, Easter to a lot of people, okay, we talked about that a little bit, it's about the resurrection, uh, Jesus from the dead. Now, I got a couple of pings this morning on my phone early. I'm like, what the heck? One was from Nikolai. One was from Anya in Ukraine. Because I forgot, this is the Orthodox Easter. The Russian Orthodox. See, that's, they celebrate the Easter on this Sunday. Okay. But last week, I think we tried to make it pretty clear, that's really kind of a tradition anyway. I mean, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is a fact to be believed by the testimony of many witnesses and believed on in the world to various degrees of understanding wasn't really a celebration as far as a holiday in the Bible. Okay, men tend to make things holidays based on whatever. It's called tradition. What the Lord did say, and we just kind of went through a little participation there, showing our Lord's death till he come, the church came together on the first day of the week to do exactly what we did today, which obviously is about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and all that means. Now, but I got thinking, because we talked about the resurrection from the dead last Sunday, and one of the passages that we ended with last week, which is quite shocking uh, in today's day and time, as it's always been, the Apostle Paul, we closed with last week, said in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, Speaking of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus when? Before time began. But now, Paul said, has now this message, this purpose and grace has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He said, death has been abolished, we said last week. That'd be kind of surprising, being we... You know, and I said that up here last Sunday. Guess what happened last Monday? Some of you know, if you was down here Wednesday night, Russell Greitman, who was a good brother in Christ, suddenly died last Monday. After we were here a week ago. Russ was out. Down there, he had a lot of rain in Indiana where they lived down there. And they had like a ditch at the end of his driveway. It was kind of plugged up. And Lori had said that and that was kind of bothering him. And, you know, he had some health issues. Wasn't all that old, though, only, what, 56 or something. So Russ goes out there with a shovel to dig that blockage out of that ditch and keeled over. Died suddenly right there on the edge of the road in his yard. Massive heart attack. So the funeral was uh, Friday. Sue and I went down there. So in light of this passage here, extra, extra, read all about it. Death has been abolished. We're dealing with that all the time. Paul said this 2,000 years ago. A lot of people died since then. But then we spoke last week. We need to understand the Bible talks about two kinds of life and two kinds of death. Well, the one death, the physical death, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed unto men to physically die once. It's just the way of all the earth. We're going to look at some verses that tell us exactly what happens when somebody physically dies. <clears throat> 
You see, to the Lord, the physical death, remember what Jesus would say, uh, I don't know if we looked at this verse or not, but it's in uh, uh, <clears throat> Luke 12, <clears throat> Luke 12 and verse 4, Jesus said, don't fear them that kill your body. Don't fear them. I say to you, my friends, don't be afraid of those that kill the body. After that, I can't do nothing. They can't do nothing. <clears throat> but I will show you, Jesus said, whom you should fear. Now fear him who after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. See, the two deaths, one is physical death. It's the way of all the earth. It's the way David described it, and it's the way Joshua described it. This day, they said, I go the way of all the earth. It happens. No problem. It is a separation from the physical world. That's what death is. It's separation. But the big separation that Jesus is concerned about, and that's why our hope is in Christ, there's a separation that occurs. I think we quoted it last week. It's just Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. It tells us that our sins and our iniquities separate us from God. Isaiah 59, Behold, the Lord's hand is not short, that he cannot save his ear is not so heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities, your sin, your transgressions have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. <clears throat> okay. Now in the Bible, New Testament, in Romans 6 and 23 tells us that the, the wages of sin is death. It's that separation. Ah, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eternal life. Eternal life. I think one of the first passages we lose, used last week in the beginnings of the lesson was to talk about how Jesus came to deliver us from this fear of death that people have all their lives. Verse 14 of Hebrews 2 and 14, inasmuch as the children, that's all of us, he's talking about just a little kid, he's talking about people, humans, are partakers of flesh and blood. We're physical beings. Now what animates a physical body is the spirit, and that's what we're going to be talking about. He, Jesus himself, likewise, shared in the same thing. In what? A physical body. Jesus had a physical body. That through death, dying on the cross, he might destroy him who had the power of death. He said, that's the devil, telling you who it is. And release those, all of us humans, who through fear of death were all their lifetimes subject to bondage. Now, I think I mentioned last week, the idea that people fear dying, physical dying, well, I mean, even I think animals do, you know, the reason why they act out some, they run away from people, they're scared. You know what I mean? You know, living things don't want to die now, I don't think plants can think maybe you talk to your plants I don't know about that you can ask them I guess if you do but it's quite obvious the way animals respond they're avoiding death okay but humans are rational beings and they know they put that together and we we don't want to die physically and that's a good thing that probably keeps us safe sometimes so slow down and wear your seatbelt. Now, <clears throat> but in the Bible, the emphasis is not to fret about the death of the body. It's the Bible that tells us the death of the body is not what's important. You know, the Bible has always been about eternal life. And all the way from since the creation of the world, that information was communicated, starting with the patriarchs, 
They understood when they died, it was a gathering to their ancestors. Genesis 25, or to their fathers, which is just another way of saying that. I'm going to give you a couple verses. First to Genesis 25 and 8. And let me see here. Uh, this is the death of Abraham. Now, he's the father of the faithful. This guy's awesome. <clears throat> it says in verse 7, I'll give you that, Genesis 25 and 7, this is the sum of the years of Abraham's life which he lived, 175 years. <clears throat> now, you remember, when you look in the beginning of the Genesis account, and Moses wrote the whole thing. And Moses is 430 years after Abraham. God, by inspiration, gave Moses the information to write down about the creation of the earth, the flood, and about the patriarchs such as Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all that. The next book is Exodus. Now, that's when Moses is on the scene. Okay, just giving a little history there. But if you remember before the flood, the people lived hundreds of years. Hundreds. Up to 900. And what is it, 96 or something? 69. 969 for Methuselah. After the flood, you see the longevity start to tank, drop right off. And it would be Moses that writes in Psalms 90 that the days of a man's years be three score and ten. And if he's strong, four score. Now, a score in the old King James language is, is uh, 20 years. Three score is 60 plus 10, 70. Do your math. I went to Bellevue, and I can figure that out. <clears throat> or 80 years. <clears throat> and you see that. As I mentioned, Brother Ross went to be with the Lord at 56. Sue's folks are older than baseball. I mean, they're 90. Her dad is 95. Her mother's like 91. But that still ain't 900 years. <clears throat> but you see, Abraham died at 175. But here's a verse I want you to see. If you look in there... <clears throat> Verse 8, that Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age. I guess that's pretty good, 175. He was an old man full of years and was what? Gathered to his people. Gathered to his people. We'll look at another one there. Look at verse 17. This is when Ishmael died. In verse 17, now he was a son of Abraham. It said that Ishmael died. He was 137 years old. Breathed his last, died, was what? Gathered to his people. So even way back in the Genesis account, the passing of people from this life to was literally to another life, to a gathering. <clears throat> All right, maybe, let me see, I'll give you another one here. I'm going to Genesis 36 and 29. Genesis 36 and 29. And let's see here. Nope, that ain't the one I want. I wrote that down wrong. Maybe it was 37 and 29. Let me check. Uh, nope. Okay. It was, sorry. They're right together on my page. That's how I messed that up. Uh, it's Genesis 35. <clears throat> it's about Isaac. Verse 28. 28. Now the days of Isaac were 100 in 80 years. So Isaac breathed his last, died, was gathered to his people, being old, full of days. His sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Now you'll see that repeatedly. Uh, the people dying and going, being gathered to their fathers, to their ancestors, to their people, whatever. <clears throat> now, in fact, Moses, the same thing. I'll, you know, I'll give you his too. Just for fun. Je Je Exodus, Exodus. Oh, sorry, sorry. Deuteronomy. Read my own notes. Deuteronomy. Uh, God told him he was going to die. I'm going to Deuteronomy 31. Deuteronomy 31. And let's see here. 16. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, you will rest 
or be gathered to your ancestors, join your ancestors. You will rest with your fathers, and this people will rise up and play the harlot and basically rebel against me. So God told him, <clears throat> you're going to die and go to that unseen abode of the dead. Now, Hades, <clears throat> when you see that, generally in your New Testament, speaks about Hades, or the unseen abode of the dead. That's what Hades is. I think we looked a little at that a little bit last week. Jesus actually tells the story of two men in Luke 16 that died. One was a beggar man, one was a rich man. Uh, <clears throat> Jesus tells the story, so we know he knows what he's talking about. When the beggar died, uh, he was carried by the angels, in, in Luke 16 and 22, Jesus said, to Abraham's side, to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, but he woke up in torments. Okay, now what the Bible talks about, when people die, they do go somewhere. They're not just out of existence. I mean, you have some people that actually believe when people die, they're just gone. And actually, it's kind of surprising. Uh, some of the Jews actually believed that. They didn't believe in a resurrection. The Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection, spirits, or angels. Yet the Bible tells about all that. But I said it's no surprise that maybe Jews, even with having that information in their own scripture, didn't believe it. There's a whole lot of people don't believe what the Bible says, who say they believe the Bible. They don't. They ignore it. But I like it when we get all this inside information from God about some of these things. Now, there is a lot of information concerning what happens when a person dies. Now, James tells us, uh, New Testament, book of James, right after Hebrews and Philemon there. Now he says, it's just kind of a one-liner. Verse 26, James, or sorry, 2 and 26, James 2 and 26. For as the body without a spirit is dead... He said, well, faith without works is dead, too. Now, he stated it like that because it's just simply understood. When a human body don't have a spirit in it, it's dead. It's dead. Now, what actually happens, we got a couple examples. Uh, you can go back to Genesis 35 for a second. This is when Rachel dies. The Bible describes her death and says... Uh, she died on the road to Bethlehem there. Uh, whoop, down. Let me see here. Go. I gotta get my own pages turned here. Sorry, folks. In Genesis 35, she's in labor. Hard labor. Uh, verse 17, pick up there, Genesis 35, 17. And so it was. Well, no, yeah, 17. Now it came to pass when she was in hard labor, the midwife said to her, Do not fear, you will have this son also. And so it was as her soul was departing, for she died, it says, that she called his name Ben Oni, which is but his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrathah, that is in Bethlehem. It says, and I want you to just see here, it says her soul was departing from her body. Now if you fast forward to the New Testament for a second, and I want you to look in Luke chapter 8, you see Jesus... He's going to raise up a little girl that died in Luke 8. This was a girl, a daughter of a, the ruler of a synagogue. His name was Jairus. You see his name in verse 41. The girl who died, it says in 42, was 12 years old. 12 years old. So Jesus gets to the house in verse 51, doesn't allow anyone to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the father and the mother of the girl. 
Now everybody else is weeping and mourning for her, but Jesus said, do not weep. She is not dead. She is sleeping. Now, I know last week when we looked at the death of Lazarus, he said the same thing uh, back in John 11. He, he waited. He heard Lazarus was sick. He waited. Then he told the apostles, we're going to go to him. He's sleeping, and I'm going to wake him out of sleep. And the apostles said, well, Lord, if he's sleeping, he's doing good. He's getting rest and sleep. And then it says, Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad, he said, that I was not there for your sakes. So when Mary and Martha saw him come, and they go, oh, Lord, if you'd have been here, our brother wouldn't have died. He said, your brother will rise again. They go, yes, Lord, we know in the resurrection the last days that I am the resurrection. And, of course, he calls Lazarus out of the tomb, and people are freaked out. <gasps> Easy. Because he'd been dead four days is what Martha said. So when it says here, Jesus said, don't weep, she's not dead. He said, she's sleeping. They mocked, they ridiculed him. <laughs> but come on. You know, we know a dead person when we see it. He put everybody outside, took her by the hand, and said, little girl, arise. Now look what it says in verse 55. Then her spirit returned, and she arose immediately, and he commanded that she be given something to eat. It says her spirit returned. Because James said, we read it in 2.26, a body that don't have a spirit in it is dead. I think some of these guys that are still running EMS, medical responses, I know, would know this. When I taught CPR for the American Red Cross, I was an EMT at the time, and I was already going on you know, medical calls and with the fire department and the rescue squad. And you know, when you teach CPR to people, they're supposed to do it step by step by step. So if they find somebody on the floor unresponsive or whatever, you're supposed to get down there and you're supposed to shake and shout. Hey! No, not you. You're supposed to shake the person. Hey, man! Hey! Hey! You're supposed to shake and shout. <laughs> and then you're supposed to look, listen, and feel. Look to see if they're breathing. Get down here to see if they are. And feel for a pulse. Do you know what? In all the calls I went on when we had a, a dead person, whether in a car accident or laying at home on the floor, I never did that. I never did that. I could tell when I walked through the door, dude's dead. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> a body without a spirit in it not only is dead, it looks dead. They don't look like they're sleeping to me. They never did. You guys are you're backing me up on this. We'll talk privately. <laughs> look, it's obvious. My point is, it's obvious. A body that doesn't have a spirit in it doesn't even look quite natural. And don't get me wrong, I'm not making light of the thing. I'm telling you it's a fact, but Jesus said that is no big deal. That is not a big deal. In fact, it's actually a good thing. Though our hope is that this body ain't it. And your life in this body ain't it. Now, this is one account of an out-of-body experience that I believe. Now, don't get me wrong. I think the so-called claims of out-of-body experiences are not all that far-fetched because biblically it's a fact that you have a body, but it has a spirit in it. And according to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul had such an experience and he stated so clearly in fact he said he wasn't exactly sure how that was happening in fact so that he didn't draw a lot of attention to himself and people fall down and worship him or something 
At first, when he starts to tell you about the experience, he acts like he's talking about somebody else until you read the whole thing and you realize he's talking about himself. 2 Corinthians 12. He said, it's doubtless not profitable for me to boast, because again, he doesn't want to draw attention to himself. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Now I know a man in Christ Jesus who 14 years ago, whether in the body, I don't know, or out of the body, I don't know, God knows, such a one that was caught up to the third heaven, he said, and I know such a man, he said, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. He said, God knows how he was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I would boast, but not of myself. He's talking about himself. He's the one. He said he was taken to the third heaven. Now, <clears throat> What's the third heaven? In the Bible, the way the Jews understood it, the first heaven is where the birds are flying around. The second heaven is where the stars are at, the outer space. The third heaven is where God is at. It's not in this dimension. That's where God's at. That's where he said, I was taken. I heard words it's not lawful for man to utter. He said, I was taken to paradise. But that's the only out-of-body experience I'm really going to go for, even though they've wrote books on it. There's been doctors that have testified the fact that people that re you were resuscitated. Now, I have been involved in resuscitation of a person that was clinically dead. I've done that with people on the, on the road. You know, we're doing CPR like crazy, flying down the road. We get them to the hospital, and everybody's working on them. I had a doctor one time. We had a doctor inserted a, a pacemaker right down somebody's artery while we were do, working on them and got that pacemaker in there and got that heart going. So they can now that's a person that's clinically dead, not breathing, has no pulse, but not biologically dead. Okay, now unless they fall through the ice, you know, the mammalian diver's reflex. If you pull somebody out from under the ice and they're not breathing, they have no pulse, don't give up on them, they said, until they're warm and dead, not cold and dead. Because amazing things have happened because of the, the so-called mammalian diver's reflex. It puts them in some sort of state of suspended animation or something, I don't know, the cold water. They've had people resuscitated. They were under the ice for over half an hour. Amazing. But that's not some kind of miracle, okay? That's not just some kind of miracle. Now, but Paul actually describes an out-of-body experience because the Bible supports the fact, as Peter would say, he called his body a tent. He said in 2 Peter... <clears throat> Chapter 1, because <clears throat> you remember, the Lord told Peter he was going to be put to death. He knew that. So he knew he would die a martyr's death, and he knew it was coming, but he wasn't worried about it. He wasn't worried about it. In verse 10, 2 Peter 1 and 10, Peter writes, Therefore, brethren, <clears throat> be even more diligent to make your calling election sure, for if you do all these things that he lists, uh, you know, to, you know, get your act together and, you know, grow spiritually, you'll never stumble. There will be an entrance supplied to you un abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, for this reason, he said, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in this present truth. Yes, I think it's right, Peter said, as long as I am in this tent, now he's talking about his body, as long as I am in this tent, he's talking about his body isn't the emphasis, it's him in there, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as the Lord Jesus has shown me. 
Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my death. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about his death. <clears throat> but he's okay with it. He said, I just want to make sure you always have this information. And guess what, brethren? 2,000 years out. What do we have right here in our hand? We just read it. It's from Peter. We still have it. He's still reminding us right now, 2,000 years later. He said, I want to make sure you have this. And so we do. But he said he was going to have to put off his body, his tent. I mean, we think about that. You ever been camping? You got a tent, right? You unzip the thing, you get in, right? And you come out. You in and out of your tent. That's how he referred to his physical body. A tent. You know, the Apostle Paul basically said the same thing. If you look in uh, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, Paul says in verse 6, I am ready, already, being poured out <clears throat> as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the fight, the good fight. I have kept or finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only me only, but also all those who have loved his appearing. He knows he's passing from this life to the next to receive his reward. He's totally cool with it. Just like Peter was. They weren't all anxious about that idea. In fact, Paul would say in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I know we read this probably last week, but in verse 16, 2 Corinthians 4 and 16, Therefore, Paul said, we don't lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Ross, as I mentioned, he had health issues. Uh, he, he did, you know, quite a few things, and you know, and going out and digging is a lot of work. You know, I was doing that too the other day, uh, digging holes. Uh, and uh, it's a lot of work. Got to be careful about that. The outward man is getting weaker, and the outward man is perishing. But the inward man, if you're in Christ Jesus, if you're born again, that inward man is being renewed day by day, and that is the real you. The real you. Our light affliction, Paul said, which is only for a moment, our time here is real short. James says, your life here is like a vapor. It appears like the morning mist and it vanishes away. That's about what your physical time here is compared to, a morning mist. We're not looking, Paul said, at the things which are seen, the physical world, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary. The things that are not seen are eternal. The Bible tells us, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. You know, human beings are made for this. Human beings have the capacity to see and understand things. That's what's seeing things that are above. It's knowledge. That's what faith is based on, information, all kinds of information that communicates to us from God about what this physical life is actually all about and the spiritual life that it's the important part. To learn, to grow. You realize our time here on the earth is short, but it, this is where people are perfected for eternal life. Eternal life. That's all God is doing down here with this earth. I won't lie to you. Jesus said few people will actually find the way, and that's in Matthew chapter 7. Not because it's, God doesn't want them to know. It's because they ain't, they ain't looking, don't care to look. I would assume most everybody in this room is not in that group because that's why we're, we come here. Many have been born again. Some maybe not yet. Some may be considering what they're doing, which is a good thing. Look what he says. <clears throat> the things that are not seen are eternal. You can't see a spirit. It's eternal. You can't see God. He's eternal. Anything that is of God, the heavenly realm, is not perceived with the physical eyes. You can't see it, taste it, touch it, smell it, feel it. None of the five senses apply, but human beings have eternity placed in their heart by Almighty God. People, only humans. You never see an animal worrying about getting old and dying. You know what I mean? It just happens to them. Human beings fret about it all the time. 
because he's placed eternity in our hearts. And we know there's got to be more, man. Look what he says in chapter 5. We know, Paul said, if our earthly house, this tent, now there he's calling it a tent too, just like Peter did, is destroyed. If your physical body is destroyed, Paul said, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands. It's eternal. It's in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not found to be naked. For we who are in this tent, this physical body, this feeble flesh and blood, groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that our mortality may be swallowed up by life, eternal life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Now his Holy Spirit is given to you when you are born again. When you're baptized into Christ, you receive forgiveness of your sins and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is specifically stated to strengthen your inner man, your inner man, you on the inside, so you can begin to walk in a newness of life, putting off an old man, which is corrupt, not only physically, but corrupt morally, and to put on a new man. Maybe I better read that one real quick. Don't lose your place. I'm coming right back here, but you want to grab this in Ephesians uh, chapter 4. Paul, writing to Christians, said, Now, Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 17, I, This I say now, Paul said to the Christian, You should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. Why? Because of the ignorance that's in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, Christian. If indeed you've heard him and you've been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, you put off concerning your former conduct. Your old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul would say, going back to the passage we just left, he's going to tell you, if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. This is radical. It's preparation for eternal life. People don't want to die. Well, you're going to die physically. But Jesus said, there ain't no big deal. It happens to everybody. It's about the next life. We don't want to be separated forever from God because of our sins and iniquities. We need that problem taken care of. I want the new life. I want the strength in my inner man now. It's a blessing now to overcome. You guys know my story. I drank every day for years and years and years. Drunk out of my mind. Years and years. And so did some of you. <laughs> As Paul would say, it's such for some of you in 1 Corinthians 6. We all been there and done that, Paul said. In fact, we didn't read that in Ephesians 2. He said to the Christian, he made you alive. You was dead. He said, you was dead. In your trespasses and sins, when you walked according to the course of this world, when you, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in what the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. We were by nature children of wrath, just as others, but God in his mercy and, had, and in his great love with which he loved us, even <clears throat> when we was dead in trespasses and sins. He said he made us alive. That has to happen on this side of the sod, brethren. That has to happen on this side. Heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. It's always been about eternal life. Since we read it, we ain't going back there, but remember what Paul said, this message of the hope of eternal life that was preached, he said, has been since before time began. 
That's before the Garden of Eden. This is God's eternal purpose. I didn't read it, but it was in Ephesians 1.4. It says to the Christian, just as he chose us in him when? Before the foundation of the world that we should be what? Holy and without blame before him in love. Does before the foundation of the world sound like before the Garden of Eden? You see, there's an eternal purpose of God in Christ Jesus. It always was. God doesn't want anybody to perish is what the Bible says. It's always been about physical life, physical life ends, and immediately, because Jesus said that death has been abolished. You know, I die every night. I mean, when I go to sleep, my eyeballs close. Whoop, I'm, man, I'm gone, man. You know, consciousness, gone. Next thing I know, I'm back. <laughs> you wake up. Of course, I'm usually in the same place. But one day, well, for me, I'm all kinds of different places than I think about. But the idea is, it's going to be like that. That's why Jesus said, you ain't going to die. A man believe in me? He said, he ain't never going to die. Not the death that you ought to be concerned about. You will just simply, Russ was probably out there digging that ditch and thinking, man, this is hard work, and looked down and saw himself laying there going, whoa, hey, man, that looks like me. I must be dead. Because people stopped, people tried to help him, and Russ would have said, huh, well, how about that? Man, I'm gone. Didn't see a thing. Never happened. You know, and all of a sudden, who knows, maybe angels showed up. It said they came and got Lazarus, the beggar man. Maybe a couple of angels said, forget that ditch, Russ, let's go, man. You done <laughs> dig your last hole right there, man. I don't know. Amen. That's our hope. Right. That that's as about as natural as it can get. Now we read where Rachel's spirit was departing from her body. We saw the little girl's spirit came back to her body. We see that a body without a spirit in it is dead. And I told you, and that's my experience, dead people don't look like they're sleeping. They look like something's missing. Well, there's something missing. Their spirit. Now, we read last week in Ecclesiastes, so we won't go back there. The Bible says the spirit goes back to God who gave it. But now, continuing as we're finishing up here, Paul said, God who has prepared us, it's back there in, uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and 5, God, it's God who prepared us for this very thing, and he's also given us his spirit as a guarantee. If you have his spirit, you're going to make it because the Holy Spirit is given to you to do the transformation of our character. As we grow in faith, he brings us into conformance with the image of the Son of God, Christ Jesus himself. Paul said, verse 6, Now we're always confident now, knowing, that while we are at home in our body, our tent, Paul said we are absent from the Lord. Okay? For we walk by faith, not by sight. And we're confident, yes, well, pleased rather to be absent from the body to, to be what? Present with the Lord. He said that's your preference. He's telling you, here's your preference. Here's your confidence. To be, it, yes, well pleased to be absent from the body like I said last week you don't want to talk about that at work so much people might get worried that you're about ready to go postal or something on them or freak <laughs> out when you're talking about it'd be better to be dead right now than to be here that'd be calling the security <clears throat> yeah to be absent Paul said but therefore we make it our aim verse 9 whether we're, we're present or absent we just want to be well pleasing to him and he tells you why verse 10 for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive for the deeds done in our body according to what we've done whether good or bad we read that last week it's appointed unto men once to die then the judgment this is all about eternal life, always has been. It's supposed to be a good thing, a happy thing, that we want to live. We don't have to fear death. 
It's just simply the way of all the earth. But Jesus said there is a death you need to be concerned about. Is if you're separated from God now and you ain't right with God, you ain't going to be if you drop dead right now. Because that, that, that is not the place to start to get your act together. It's not when you're dead. It's supposed to be now so you can enjoy that preparation according to knowledge and you can be moving forward closer and closer and while the outward man is perishing your inward man is being renewed day by day you can enjoy the journey why not I like that idea you know that's our hope the hope of eternal life we won't go there now because we're out of time but I was going to show you in 1 Corinthians 15 51 Paul says it happens in a twinkling of an eye the transformation boom from this life to the next how fast do your eyes twinkle easy I think they twinkle pretty fast. He would say in other places that the shout of the archangel, well, that's the second coming of the Lord, though, that one. But you know, your life could end as it did with Brother Ross. Or when you're going down the road here and somebody's coming the other way doing this, you know, messing with their phone, coming through the stop sign at 60 miles an hour. That might be it for you. So, but anyway, we're not going to worry about that. So, thank you for your attention this morning.